le chambon sur l'oignon. Sits on the massif central, the high plateau between the valleys of the Loire and the Rhone rivers in south central France. It's an isolated place, one of the least populated regions in the country, windswept and very cold in the winter. With forests and rocky volcanic peaks rising above the towns nestled in the river valleys. The current population of Le Chambon is less than 3,000, but in 1940, the town and its surrounding villages had a population of about 5,000. Back then, as now, agriculture was the primary means of making a living, along with some who gave hospitality to a few hikers who would come to climb the peaks. Back then, as now, the town was an enclave for the descendants of the French Huguenots, or Huguenots, as we would say, Protestants who had a long history of prosecution and resistance in France. In a country that was 90% Catholic, this little town on the windswept plateau of the Massif Central was 90% Protestant. It was a town that knew what it was like to be a persecuted minority on the edges of society. But back then, unlike now, France was under control of the Vichy government, who had capitulated to the Nazi regime and collaborated with them to deport France's Jewish population to the concentration camps. In many ways, Le Chambon was ordinary. It was a little country town full of ordinary people who were trying to survive a long and deadly war and an occupation by a brutal regime. Many were hungry, many were poor, and all were on rations. They farmed and taught and doctored and mothered and tried to get by as best they could. Yet the people of Le Chambon were also extraordinary especially extraordinary in their dedication to their Christian values in a time of extreme vulnerability. They also had a rather extraordinary pastor. Andre Trocme, who along with his wife Magda preached and lived a gospel of peace and nonviolent resistance. On the Sunday after France capitulated to the Nazis in 1940, Pastor Trocme preached to his congregation that the duty of Christians requires acts of resistance through weapons of the spirit. Instead of accepting Vichy collaboration with the Nazis, Trocme encouraged the people of Le Chambon to refuse to give up their consciences to participate in hatred, betrayal, and murder. The community responded by reaching out to their Jewish brothers and sisters. Beginning in 1940, first a trickle and then a flood of Jewish refugees began to come to Le Chambon. Some of them were French, who had escaped from Paris or other cities, but some of them were from Germany, from Hungary, from Poland. Many of them were children, separated from their parents who had been deported. And each one who came to Le Chambon, each one, whether a child or an adult, man or woman, rich or poor, infant or elderly, each one found shelter in Le Chambon. Each one was found a home to stay in, was fed and clothed and hidden. Each one was given forged identification papers and ration cards. The children without parents were found homes, and schools opened their doors to extra students, not just for a few days or a few weeks, but for years. The radical welcome and hospitality, this refusal of the people of Le Chambon to recognize and maintain barriers between insiders and outsiders is the sort of radical vision that Paul is expressing in this morning's passage from Ephesians. At first glance, once we get over our 12-year-old giggles about the mention of circumcision, uh, this text appears to be about a declaration of unity among the early Christ followers in those uh, first churches that Paul and his disciples founded. And certainly this is Paul's message. 
One of the struggles of the early church, and one that Paul frequently addressed in his letters to the fledgling congregations, was the struggle of the two disparate primary groups of the church, Jews and Gentiles, and how they were going to overcome their differences and become one people. The references to the circumcised and the uncircumcised are shorthand for the two groups, those who practice all the strict physical dietary ritual and purity laws of the Jews, and those who don't. Paul insists that those external identity markers of Jewish law have been abolished through Christ, and the walls that previously divided the two groups are gone. But there is another layer of meaning to this passage revealed by examining Paul's rhetoric and the context in which he was writing. This really wasn't just a tame, y'all get along now text. It was a text that was meant to shake the empire. The letter to the Ephesians is one of those texts that scholars argue about whether it was authentically written by Paul or not. Some scholars believe that because of its language and theology, it was really written by a later disciple in Paul's name, probably circulated in the late first century, while others suggest that it was a late letter by Paul written in the last years before his death, sometime around the year 64. In either case, the letter circulated during a time known as the Pax Romana, a time of calm that existed during the first and second century Roman Empire, which is the Mediterranean portion of the empire is on the screen now. The Roman emperors, uh, Augustus in particular, thought of themselves as the semi-divine inaugurators of this unprecedented peace that ended the turbulent rivalries of the Mediterranean and Asia Minor. The Roman brand of peace, of course, was not characterized by justice and abundance and equality for all. Rather, it was a peace characterized by fear and scarcity and higher, rigid hierarchy and enforced by military dominance. When necessary, terror would be used, specifically the terror of crucifixion for anyone foolhardy enough to challenge peace on the empire's terms. On state occasions and festival days, such as the birthday of the emperor, when the emperor's lordship would be celebrated, the emperor as peace bringer would be extolled in public speeches. Now Ephesus was the regional Roman capital of Asia Minor in what is now the modern country of Turkey. And it was an important city of commerce and of government. For the Christians of Asia Minor, living under the iron rule of Rome, any talk of peace would be politically charged talk. The rhetoric of Ephesians directly challenges the boastful claims of Rome's emperors and undermines a political system that secures insider distinction and top-down privilege by setting up barriers that identify some as outsider or inferior. Paul's claim that Christ is our peace would have been a pronouncement bordering on treason. What is being claimed, after all, is that despite all of the assertions of Rome's emperors, true peace has been inaugurated by a man that the empire crucified. True peace comes when none are strangers and aliens, but all are fellow citizens. Ephesians declares peace on new terms, a peace forged not by the lords of empire, but in the vulnerability of the crucified Christ. The cross, the symbol of terror and oppression, has undermined the wall dividing Jew and non-Jew, and that is only the beginning. Like Paul, Andre Trocme urged his community to obey God rather than man when there was a conflict between the commandments of the government and the commandments of the Bible. As the Vichy government increased its persecutions of Jews in 1942, Reverend Trocme faced increased pressure to provide names of protected Jews in Le Chambon. When he was given an order requiring him to name and locate the Jews in his community, Trocme refused. He said, no, I cannot. First, I do not know their names, and I do not know who they are. 
And second, these Jews, they are my brothers. I do not know what a Jew is. I only know human beings. The community shut off streetlights and warned the Jews to go into hiding. As the police searched the houses of the community, Jews fled into the wooded countryside, aided by the villagers. And not one village member ever revealed a Jew in hiding or denounced a neighbor for sheltering them. In the years between 1940 and the liberation of Europe, the people of Le Chambon, a town of 5,000, sheltered some 5,000 refugees. Most, if not all, of the people who gave shelter to refugees in Le Chambon are gone now. They rarely spoke after the war of the work they did for their Jewish brothers and sisters. If they were still alive, they would tell you that what they did was not extraordinary at all. They would tell you that they only did what was right to do. They didn't agonize over the choice to help, because for them there was no choice involved. The people of Le Chambon were living out Paul's declaration that Christ is our peace, not the Pax Romana, or any false peace created by an oppressive regime. They demonstrated with their lives that there are no longer strangers or aliens, but all are fellow citizens with God's people belonging to God's household. We are not living under a cruel empire or a brutal dictatorship. We're not called on to live out our Christian values in secret the way that the church at Ephesus did or the villagers of Le Chambon. But we are living in a time of deep division in our society, a time that is ruled by fear and suspicion. Whether the year is 64 or 1940 or 2015, we still see the world in terms of insiders and outsiders, and we continue to build walls that shut people out. How will we be challenged in the days to come to see and tear down the barriers of hatred that divide us? Who is the stranger and the alien in our midst whom we need to bring into the household of God? I offer you the challenge that a friend offered me last week. My seminary classmate, Mark McKenzie, posted an article with this photo on his Facebook page last week. The article was about the surging numbers of Confederate battle flag rallies that are occurring across the country in the wake of the Charleston massacre and the removal of the flag in many public places. But what he said about the article was not what I expected from my transgender, super liberal, anti-racist alley friend. Mark posted, I would urge my liberal-leaning friends not to look away. These are people crying out to be noticed in what they perceive to be a sea of antagonists to their cause. The more we ignore them, the louder they get. I want to pay attention, yet I'm repulsed by the hatred and twisting of truth. What collective agency do we have as anti-racist allies? Can we not address these fearful folk? Is it not our job? If not us, then who? Mark's post was a challenge to me to ponder the ways I continue to build walls between myself and others. He challenged me to understand that I still allow barriers of hatred to divide me from others. He challenged me to remember that God's household includes everybody. He challenged me to not allow my fear to get in the way of standing on the side of justice. Building the household of God doesn't mean we build a place to visit briefly on Sundays, a sort of a weekly timeout where we pretend peace is possible by sitting next to people we scrupulously avoid the rest of the week. <laughs> the church, the household of God, must be the daring practice of a new politics, a different kind of power the self-outpoured, boundary-crossing power of Christ's cross. 
We must put our trust in this power, the power of Christ, letting it undermine every wall until we are truly built into a place where God lives through the Spirit. Amen.